the fight is not yours, you have to fight. When you hit the enemy, it should be death, not injury. You must be effective. Without inspiring the men, you can't do the type of activity that is expected of a soldier. Trying to be humble may make you very pretentious. It is better you have pride. Accepting failure is a dangerous process. <laughs> it's better you learn not to fail. You're in the forces. Failure may mean death. You can't learn after that. Namaskaram. Namaskaram to all of you. It's a great uh, privilege and honor to be talking to the bravest men of Bharat. Namaskar Sadhguru. On behalf of Air Vice Marshal Pawan Mohe, Vishis Seva Medal, Commandant, College of Defense Management, I extend a very warm welcome to you with, for this interaction with officers and ladies of the College of Defense Management. It is indeed my honor to conduct this evening's session on the topic of engineering for combating adversities. Adverse circumstances and situations are an integral part of a life for a soldier and their families. As soldiers battle the enemy on our borders, our families hold the home front and face encounter numerous challenges and with utmost courage and perseverance. However, we've been born into an unpredictable and an imperfect world. As finite human beings who have shortcomings, who make mistakes, face decision dilemmas and carry our own set of worries. There is much to contend with and our ability to handle adversities is limited. While our unabated inquest to seek answer continues, we are indeed proud and privileged to have amongst us honorable and respected Sadhguru, a yogi, a visionary humanitarian, and the most widely followed global spiritual leader. In 2017, Sadhguru was conferred the Padma Vibhushan, one of India's highest civilian award accorded for exceptional and distinguished service. Sadhguru bridges the gap between known and the unknown, enabling all to explore and experience the deepest dimensions of life, which give us an insight into the finite energy and delight that makes up the universe. Without any further delay, I would now address the first question to respected Sadhguru. Sadhguru, as per the karma theory, karma is accumulated impression of past activity, either of thought, emotion or physical action. During operations, as a professional soldier, I am expected to obey the orders of my superior authority, as also resort to actions which may result in injury or death of another human being. Which karma account will have to enter this transaction? Mine, my superior military authority, further senior commanders, and the upward list could go on. Could you please throw some light on it? Namaskaram. My uh, utmost uh, respects to all of you, brave men and uh, above all your families who bear the brunt of your bravery <laughs> in many ways of daily living in suspense and uh, anxiety about your well-being. So I bow down to all of you for this. See, when it comes to a fighting force, Well, you did not start the fight. When you hit the enemy, you are not hitting for personal pleasure. You are fulfilling a larger purpose. This is important that we do not mix up philosophies of life <laughs> which are manufactured in our heads with the realities of our existence. We are still not in that kind of a world or we have failed to create that kind of a world. The failure is uh, uh, mine and people like me. Because we have failed to create a world where the world will embrace each other, everybody will embrace each other and live in love and joy, such a thing we have failed to create. Men like you have to fight, it is still the reality. Anybody who is denying the reality for themselves will pay a huge price. I think we as a culture, as a land, we have paid this price already 
centuries before that, because we thought we can deal with life with philosophies, a few hundred men who came from elsewhere managed to conquer us, rule us, do all kinds of things to us. Even a business company which comes ends up ruling us for over 250 years. So, it's time to understand in free India, a soldier should know the fight is not yours. You're fighting our fight. You're <laughs> fighting because of my failure <laughs> to be able to create a loving and joyful world. So, you have to fight and when you fight and when you hit, uh, you said that it may cause injury or death. I know this will be shocking for people that I say this, no, when you hit the enemy, it should be death, not injury. That's not a good thing because you're not a police force, you're a fighting force on the border, you will fight only with those forces which will threaten the nation. So, <laughs> you must be effective, you should not be fluffy with philosophy. Well, we have a famous teaching in the country, I'm not an expert in this, I have not even read it prop by, uh, you know, in its real sense. Uh, but you know, uh, someone who is supposed to be godlike, a divine entity, is encouraging another person who happens to be a warrior, who… Uh, whose head is fluff, fluffed up with philosophies. So all that the divine entity is trying to do in the form of Arjuna and Krishna is that he's trying to bring some practical sense. You're a warrior, you're on the battlefield and now your head is fluffed with philosophy. This is not going to work. To put it very bluntly, this is all the teaching is. Because your actions have to be relevant for the situations in which you exist. If you go into the battlefield and you don't hit the enemy the way you should and you come back with your uh, karmic stuff, <laughs> your, your karma in a nice uh, flowery way, this is very bad karma because nation's resources are being wasted and the possibility of what it could bring to the country is another thing. So it's very, very important that we need to understand there is an existential situation, there is a psychological and emotional situation and there is a social situation, these are all not the same things. So, a fighting force handles a certain existential reality that still human beings have ca not come to this point where they can hold hands and live joyfully with each other. We've still not come there. Hope we get there. It's an ideal, but it is not something that we will see <laughs> immediately. It is going to… I don't know how long they, we will take. But we should not give up the ideal, but till then, we have to manage the practical as it should be. The next question, Sadhguru. As we grow up in armed forces, sometimes the circumstances around us compel us to take autocratic decisions. Over a period of time, these become rigid habits which some of us unknowingly display in form of arrogant behavior. While professional competence and ambition is necessary to climb up the ladder, one important quality of humility continues to be ignored as too many leaders think that they can't be humble and ambitious at the same time. Could you please highlight the importance of humility for any leader and how do we develop this essential skill? So, uh, <laughs> uh, that means somebody is trying to be a commandant even at home with the family. I think by now you should have discovered it doesn't work <laughs> Well, this habit of giving orders should not become a habit. It is important, once again I stress, in a fighting force, which is not a normal kind of social situation where we can sit down and debate about everything. No, once a leader says something, others, whether it makes much sense to them or not, sometimes they just have to do it because there are moments in our life, there are situations when we are in intense activity, where there is no room for debate. Debate should happen elsewhere. There cannot be a debate on the battlefield. Again, I'll go back to Kurukshetra, this is a debate on the battlefield. If you take up the Bhagavad Gita and read, I don't know how long it'll take to read that eighteen chapters because I have not, but I believe it'll take at least four or five hours. 
So if you stand with your enemy uh, army standing there and for four or five hours if you're debating, you, you know what is your fate. So that's exactly what Krishna is just trying to tell Arjuna, this is not a time to debate. So officers have to uh, <laughs> even if that is not their natural uh, way, they have to be a certain level of command and force, otherwise those situations won't work. But if you try the same method everywhere, it won't work either. About humility, see what a leader needs is, he needs integrity first of all. Integrity means, in your thought and emotion, everything that you do is not about yourself, it is about the larger well-being. If this becomes your way, if this is your sense of integrity, integrity is not just a bunch of morals or values or ethics, integrity means that your intentions have become larger than personal. Your intentions are not about your well-being, it's always about larger well-being. As long as this is fixed and you have this integrity, uh, you don't have to try to act uh, like a humble pie, it's really not necessary. Integrity must be there and above all, people will respect a leader because he has some insight. Because when you say a leader, in some way, either a society or an organization or a force like yours, places you on a perch. If you sit on a perch, you must see something more than what others are seeing. If you sit on a perch and still don't see any better than those who are down there, then uh, you will become an object of ridicule. So it's very important that an officer or a leader must develop insight. If there is no insight, if you don't see things clearly, then it'll… all that'll happen is ridicule, not really leadership. And another a important aspect is, as a leader, it is not by words that you can inspire people. Inspiration is very, very needed, especially in a force like yours. Without inspiring the men, you can't do the type of activity that is expected of a soldier. If this inspiration has to happen, it's not just about inspiring words. Nobody is going to listen to those words. The important thing is you live in such a way that you burn with such intensity that people cannot help catching fire and be intense along with you. So inspiration, insight and integrity, if these three things if you have, you don't have to be humble. What is humility? Let's understand this. Humility comes to you because… not because you pretend a certain kind of behavior. Trying to be humble may make you very pretentious. It is better you have pride in what you're doing, when you have pride in what you're doing, when you're very proud of what you do and how you do, then it… G it takes care of you stepping on other people. And above all, if we understand our position on this planet, in this cosmos, <laughs> this… Uh, this solar system is a tiny speck. In that… in this tiny speck of a solar system, Planet Earth is a micro-speck. In that micro-speck, India is another speck. In that micro, super micro-speck, your battalion is a super, super micro-speck. In that, you are a big man, this is a lot of trouble. If you just understand, we are a speck of life. Nature has given us… creation has given us so many privileges of experiencing our life individually, but if you look at the life of the planet and who we are, we are a small pop-up and we will pop out one way or the other. If we understand the context of the time that we occupy here as human beings, the space that we occupy here as human beings and who we are, well, we are just a tiny speck. If you are just conscious about this, there is no need for humility, you will be fine. You know, I must tell you this, uh, as a rule, <laughs> when my daughter was growing up, I made sure that nobody teaches her anything. I said, nobody should teach her anything, she will grow up by herself. Nobody should teach her anything. People said, what about one, two, three? What about ABC? What about Mary had a little lamb? 
See, I said, I no need for ABC, no need for one, two, three, and I don't care whether Mary had a lamb or not. You just leave her alone, let her grow up. So she grew up like this, she did not understand that she's a child. She always treated everybody as equal, she called me by my first name, she called all adults like that, but uh, <laughs> she was just fine. Then I had to put her in school after some time because my travels went crazy. Then when she was about twelve, thirteen years of age, she… something happened in the school and it disturbed her, she came home and said, you're teaching everybody so many things, you're not teaching me anything <laughs> I said, see, I am not given to uh, teach anybody unsolicited. And you did not enroll, you just landed up here. So, now that you're asking, okay, sit down. I said, see, this is all you need to know about life. Never look up to anybody. She looked at me like this, what about you kind of thing. I said, especially me, never look up to me, because if you look up to me, the maximum that you will do is you'll take my picture and nail it on the wall. That's not going to do any good to you. If you see me just the way I am, it'll be of immense value. But if you look up to me, you will miss it. So never look up to anybody, never look down on anybody. You just see life just the way it is. Then you will navigate your way through life effortlessly. And this all it takes. We don't need humility, nor do we need arrogance. Both are not needed. Why can't we just handle life as it is necessary? In your book, Death and Inside Story, you mention that there is no use abusing a body through medical interventions when doctors have left no hope. But what I have been taught as a leader is to constantly struggle even when defeat is inevitable without bothering about results. So as a military man, are the principles of karma yoga not conflicting with what you have said while dealing with our dear ones? Uh, sir, as a military officer, you're dealing with young lives. Ninety-year-old men are not in your force, so that's a different affair. Uh, young men, however badly they may be mauled in a battle, still many times they're capable depending upon their grit and their constitution, they may bounce back. Of course, you have the famous story of uh, Field Marshal Man Manik Shah, of how he recovered from the machine gun fire and they'd given up on him and how he came back. So there are any number of stories like that because you are dealing with very fit, strong, determined young men. That is a different story. We are talking about trying to understand and come to terms that we are mortal. This life is mortal in nature. You cannot just think that you're going to live forever. A time comes where you must be ready to ease your way through. You must understand you come at a certain time and you go at a certain time. We don't want an untimely death, that is for everybody. Nobody should have an untimely death. But when the time is up, we must be willing to go. If we are not willing to go, we will definitely make it miserable for ourselves. Or if our uh, children or their children are not willing to let us go, that will also make it miserable. So it's extremely important that we should have handled both life and death with a certain wisdom, understanding the context, we are not here for good, that is… that is fixed. Our time here is very limited and how we use this time is important, it is not about Life's quality is not going to be enhanced by simply stretching it by another few months or a year or two, it's not going to happen with en enormous pain and, uh, you know, a nuisance for yourself and for everybody, it is not going to work like that. If you are observant of the life forces within you, you will see when life is not wanting to revive itself. You don't have to ask a doctor, if you just observe your own life forces, you will know when they're winding up. When they're winding up, you pump yourself with this, that and simply stretch it for a few weeks or months or whatever is meaningless. This is coming from a, a fundamental sense of ignorance, which unfortunately has spread around the world. But in this country, always when people came to a certain sense that, you know, life is winding up, they would simply sit in one place and uh, go on water diet and slowly go quietly,
peacefully, not uh, stuck up with so many tubes and needles, that's not the way to go. It's very important that we live well and we also die well. And not only die well, because death is the last act that we perform in our life. It's important we die in style. It's very, very important for <laughs> I know, <laughs> this may sound morbid to people, there's nothing morbid about our mortality. That is a fundamental reality of our existence. Only if we are conscious of this reality, will we plan and enact our life in as beautiful a manner as possible. Sometimes life puts you in a situation where you can't help being a certain way. Leave aside being right or wrong. The way I think and perceive is my way of doing things, but it may not be right for others. Who decides then what is the right way? And if there is one, what is the right way? <laughs> See, people who think in terms of right and wrong are too absolutist about life. Life is not about absolutism. It is uh, all one inside the other, in the sense, Creation and creator are wrapped into the same thing. Here we sit here, this very body has been created from within. So this piece of creation and the source of creation are mixed up. Or let me come to a more mundane example. Right now, if you look at it logically, see this right and wrong is because we have a linear way of thinking. Looking at everything in terms of cutting into pieces and say, okay, this and this, black and white, A and B, like this. So right and wrong. Let's say man and woman, male and female. See, right now if I ask you a question, are you a man or a woman? Well, whichever one you are, you will say that. This is absolute. I'm a man, I'm a woman is very clear. But how did you come here? Because a man and woman came together, you're here. So just because you're a woman, does it mean to say your father has made no contribution for you? Or just because you're a man, does it mean to say your mothers have made no contribution for you? Well, you are a mix-up of man and woman. On the surface, you are just a man or just a woman, but deep down, you're both. Because how can you say that your mother or your father doesn't exist within you? They do. So, this what is right, what is wrong, people who think they are doing the right thing, are always the cruelest and the most horrible people. Because a whole lot of people who think they are empowered by a divine authority, they have done the cruelest possible things in the world. So please do not think in terms of right and wrong. Our actions have to be appropriate to the situations in which we exist. What we did a thousand years ago, thinking it's right, won't fit into today. You're right now seeing in Afghanistan, what they <laughs> what they're doing right now might have been easily accepted five hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, though it's horrible any time, that's a different matter. But in today's world, it's horrific. Somehow the world is manage managing to look another way, that's a, <laughs> a different thing. But it is not about right and wrong, it is about appropriateness of our existence in a given situation when we act, any action we perform. We must know the consequence of this. My actions, will it bring well-being to myself and everybody around me? If this one thing, if you hold it within you, you don't have to worry about what is right and wrong. As long as your volition is inclusive, your intentions are inclusive, everybody's well-being is included in your intention, if you just fix this one thing, you don't worry about right and wrong. Do what is appropriate to a given situation. There is a <laughs> there is a wonderful, uh, you know, like a parable kind of thing, uh, how Vishnu handled this. So, uh, he had two wives, one is Lakshmi, another is Alakshmi. Lakshmi means wealth and money, Alakshmi means poverty and lack of wealth. So, between them a competition arose and uh, then they encountered him one day together and they asked, which one of us is more beautiful? So, Vishnu looked at it, he knows whichever way it's trouble, <laughs> whatever he says is going to be trouble. He looked at Lakshmi and said, 
See, when you are coming, you are most beautiful. To a Lakshmi, he said, when you are going, you are extremely beautiful. <laughs> this is appropriate action, <laughs> not right and wrong. So, <laughs> what kind of… do not judge people by their actions because what is the intention, what is the volition is important. Can I tell you a joke, uh, Kanu? <laughs> Hello? Please, Sadhguru, please. No, because you guys are all so serious, I'm just wondering if a joke is allowed. <laughs> so it happened one day, Shankaran Pillai went to the post office and he had a huge heap of pink colored envelopes and he bought a whole sheet of stamps and he was sticking the stamps on this pink envelope, spraying perfume and uh, keeping it on one side to mail. The postmaster saw this and said, hey, what are you doing? What are all these letters? He said, it was… he said, it's the Valentine's message. I'm sending love messages to one thousand people, one thousand men in the locality with signed, guess who? He said, why would you do such a thing? He said, I'm a divorce lawyer. So, it is not about the action, it's not about the pink envelope, lovely words and perfume, it is the intention which matters. So you fix the volition of your life that it's always inclusive. Whatever you do, you're always seeing how it includes everybody's well-being, then you don't worry about what is right and wrong, you just do what's appropriate. Sadhguru, today's children are very smart, aware and extremely competitive. Most of them are self-driven and are keen to deliver in an extremely competitive world. The only issue I see is that they are so obsessed to achieve success that they are not able to accept failure in any situation. Failure, they say, is a greater teacher than success. How do we teach our children to accept failure and learn from them? I feel accepting failure is a dangerous process. <laughs> you may get used to it <laughs> I know there's a whole lot of talk going on everywhere in all management schools, you can learn from your failure. I would say it's better you learn not to fail because it depends what you're doing. You're… you're in the forces. Failure may mean death. You can't learn after that. So it's extremely important that we should learn not to fail. But our idea of success has to be little engineered properly because now our idea of success is about being better than somebody. Our idea of success is about a certain kind of lifestyle. That is why there is so much anxiety about if some things don't work the way we planned. The important thing is, we must understand the most precious thing in our life is life itself. There's nothing else we have. We may think we have many things, it's all psychological uh, stuff that we think we have this and that. Right now, somebody thinks he has a billion dollars, somebody thinks he has wealth, somebody thinks he has this and that. If we just fade his memory a little bit, everything disappears. So the only and only thing that you have is life, keeping this in its highest possible way, most exuberant and, uh, you know, effulgent way. If you keep it that way, this will not be a problem because success and failure is not about one… one or two events that happen in your life. It is just that no matter what life threw at you, you knew what to do out of it. What life throws is not always our choice. What we make out of it is one hundred percent our choice. If you're exercising this choice always, you are a successful human being because then you will know how to be. This is the only creature which is being referred to as a being. We are not referring to a tiger and saying a tiger being or an elephant being or something else. Only this one is a being because the success of this life is that you know how to be. If you know how to be, you will keep yourself in a most fantastic state of experience because profoundness of experience is the most important thing. Right now, you may think your success will… Give, whatever is your idea of success, maybe it is money, maybe it's a position, maybe it's an award, maybe it's something else, whatever is your idea of success, 
you think will bring profoundness of experience. Somebody thinks it's money, somebody thinks it's wealth, somebody thinks it's alcohol, somebody thinks it's a drug, somebody thinks it's love, somebody thinks it's knowledge, somebody thinks it's pleasure, but essentially you're seeking profoundness of experience. Once you know how to sit here with a very profound experience of life, you are a successful human being. What we do in the world is according to the times in which we exist. This twenty-first century, we are doing a certain kind of activity. If you were here three centuries ago, we would be doing something else. If you were here ten centuries ago, we'll be doing something totally different. So what we do is not all ours. It is a consequence of the times in which we exist. But successful human being means this, that you know how to be. Uh, when I face an adverse situation, whether at work or in a relationship, I realize that I am aware of what is right or should be done, but I am not able to do it. At the same time, I am aware of what is wrong, but cannot desist from doing it. How do I overcome this constant challenge and how do I control my emotions and thoughts? See, whether you call somebody a lover or an enemy, both in war and love there is an opponent <laughs> How you deal with them is different, but there is a bit of a... you can call it a tango or a battle, but there is a certain dynamic. In both, you need some skill and some capability, otherwise it won't work. So, this aspect of life is being dragged into all kinds of things. One fundamental reason is whether it's our career, or our business, or our relationships, we are trying to milk happiness out of it. <laughs> the moment you attempt this, you or those your loved ones will slowly turn into your enemies over a period of time because that's how it works. We must understand human experience essentially comes from within us. Whether it's pain or pleasure, it comes from within us. Joy and misery comes from within us, agony and ecstasy comes from within us. If we understand this, if we take charge of this, if we take charge of the seat of experience within ourselves, what experience would we cause to ourselves? Definitely highest level of pleasantness. So if you being joyful and loving is not enslaved to anybody, you are joyful and loving by your own nature, then Every relationship will work well, whatever sort of relationships you make, everything will work well. Whatever is your career or your business or your activity in the world, you will do it to the best because there is substantial medical and scientific evidence today to show you that only when you're in a pleasant state of experience, your body and your mind will work at their best. For you to succeed on this… in this physical world, this is all it takes, that you must have a few brain cells working properly and <laughs> four limbs to do the things that you have to do. Without getting your body and your brains to function according to your needs, you will not be successful. You will only be successful by sometimes by default or by accident. That is not a good success because that success creates anxiety. It's very important, your success is rooted in your competence, your su su success is figured out in your mind. If this has to happen, it's very, very important that you're in a pleasant state of experience. That is, there may be many problems and issues outside, but you are never the issue in your life. This one thing you must take care, especially because India's safety and well-being depends on you. You should never be the issue. I know there are many issues, for everybody there are, for you the issues are of a different nature, which could threaten life and… Uh, you know, it could mean life and death, but you should never be the issue. But right now the problem is, in most human beings' lives, their own thoughts, their own emotions are the greatest impediments that they are facing. If you just cross this one thing, you will see every human being will be able to perform to their fullest level, find expression to their fullest level. This is the whole science of inner engineering, how to s make sure that you are not the problem in your life. Never, ever, I am the problem in my life. Ah, uh, there are various situations, we will 
do everything to the extent we can. What works, works. What doesn't work, work. Does not work, but this one is never the problem. This is something every human being must do. This is our mission, to make sure human beings are not tripping on their own feet. Back to karma theory, Sadhguru, with the progress in medical sciences, the life expectancy of every individual is increasing, but the pain, diseases and medical sufferings are also increasing day by day. Do we call this karma that we have to suffer in the human life? <laughs> Why do some small infants suffer from such dreaded diseases? Or is it punishment of my past karma? Why should one stay on even after completing one's responsibilities, which usually ends when children find their jobs and settle down? Oh, don't do that, please. These days children find jobs by 1820 <laughs> uh, Well, first of all, karma is not a theory and it is not a punishment and reward system in the world. Karma is a self-recording process. Every experience that happens to you, every perception that you have, this system goes on recording so that a large part of your life need not be thought through every moment. S a large part of it, which is motor functions and physical world, can be handled automatically. When I say automatically, see for example, you can walk. But do you remember, when you were probably eighteen, twenty months old, when you tried to walk, how difficult it was? Because on two legs, walking on a round planet, when the planet is spinning like this, is not an easy thing to do. If you look at the physical loss involved in walking, a human being walking on two legs, it is too complex. If you try to understand it, it's an enormous amount of physics, it's crazy. But today, you can just get up and walk without thinking. But if you start thinking, okay, I must put the right leg first, then the left leg, right leg, left leg, you will be confused, you won't know how to walk. So walking is not a simple thing, it's a… it's a phenomena, actually. Walking on two legs, because as far as nature is concerned, to put a four-legged animal on two legs, it took millions of years of research and development. You can call this evolution, but essentially it's research and development. Creation is doing research and development on this planet. To put a four-legged animal on two legs, you know how long it took. But today you can just do it effortlessly because uh, all your life you've done it. So, karma, this is all karma. There is genetic memory, there is evolutionary memory, there is conscious and unconscious levels of memory, articulate and in inarticulate levels of memory. So, this whole body is memory, all right? See, right now, you may not remember how your great-great-great-grandfather looked like, let's say, ten generations ago. But his nose may be sitting on your face right now, exactly like that. <laughs> your skin color, the skin tone, how your forefathers were a thousand years ago, your epithelial cells still remember. No way to confuse them. So, this what you call as myself, this whole framework of a human being, is a consequence of a certain amalgamation of memory. So, these memories are allowing you to function, this is your karma. Without this memory, you wouldn't know one thing from the other, all right? You just wouldn't know one thing from the other. So, karma is not a concept, karma is not a punishment and reward, the, you know, system. It is just that you exist only because of your karma. But it is like you build a karmic stage upon which you are supposed to do your drama. But if your karmic stage is not firm, if it is like quicksands, now you try to dance on it, you will sink into it. This is all the problem is. Your karma is not conscious, it is simply happening in a compulsive and instinctive manner. This simply means your research and development that's gone into you, you're wasting. If you are any other creature, you functioning instinctively and compulsively was all right. Once you become human, you are supposed to function intelligently and consciously. For any human being, this is important in every aspect of life, but particularly for a soldier, it is super important because it's question of life and death, that you are conscious 
and you function intelligently, you don't do compulsive reactive things because then you will do what your enemy wants you to do. Very easily they can get you into a reaction. So this is extremely important for all aspects of life. Karma is not a problem. You exist because of your karma. You don't suffer because of your karma. You suffer because you react to the karma. Or you… you are reacting to your own karma or you are reacting to somebody else's karma. It is in reaction that you suffer. See, there are only two kinds of suffering – physical suffering and mental suffering. As soldiers, you might have witnessed, even when there is grievous injuries, certain men don't suffer, they're still on. Not that there is no pain, there is enormous pain. Because physical pain is one thing, multiplying that in your mind is called suffering. Physical pain is very important for our survival. If there was no physical pain, we wouldn't protect our body, we would rip it apart. So physical pain is an essential part of our survival process, but suffering is a psychological reaction to either physiological situation or social situations around us. So karma is not the problem, karma is vital for your existence. You are an individual only because of your karmic matter. Karma does not mean good and bad, it is just memory. It is things that have already happened. You… is yesterday good or bad? There is no such thing because it's not alive. Only if it's alive and it can bite you, you can say it's good or bad. But what is dead and gone, if you react to it, even today it seems to bite you and hurt you, because what happened ten years ago, people still suffer. What may happen day after tomorrow, they already suffer. So what happened ten years ago is not alive right now. What may happen day after tomorrow cannot be alive right now because it's not happened. So you're essentially suffering that which does not exist. This is why karma is important. You understand your joy is also your karma. Your misery is also your karma. Your suffering is also your karma. You are do karma means you are doing it. Karma means action. When you say, my life is my karma, you are admitting, my life is my making. This is the most dynamic way to exist. This is the only culture on the planet who has looked life like, like this. A whole lot of cultures believe that their life is managed from somewhere above. But uh, from up there, somebody is managing. But we are sitting on a round planet which is spinning all the time. You don't even know which is up and which is down. In this cosmos, is it somewhere marked this side up and this side down? There is no such thing. You do not even know what is up and down. How come you know who is up there or who is down there? So these are childish, uh, you know, soulish that you create in your mind. Karma is a very dynamic, adult way of looking at life. This is my making. Right now, I am joyful. This is my making. Right now, I am miserable. This is my making. Right now I am the way I am, this is entirely my making. When you say, my life is my karma, you are saying, my life is entirely my making. This is the most dynamic way to exist, do not make it fatalistic, it is nothing fatalistic about it, because if you see it's my making, you can fix it. If it is God's making, you cannot fix it, that's a big difference. Uh, moving to greener pastures, Sadhguru, Having read your thoughts about golf, <laughs> can you share your Well, green, your... green is not a color, it's a destination <laughs> So, uh, can you please share your inner engineering tips for combating adversities on the golf course <laughs> There are no adversities on the golf course because uh, uh, the, this is not an artillery <laughs> thing. Nobody is trying to hit you with the ball. See, golf is a game, unlike any other game, because <laughs> I… I played a lot of field hockey when I was young. There was only one ball, twenty of us are trying to grab that ball. And it's moving at high speeds, and you have to grab it and take it, but everybody wants the same ball. When I started golf, <laughs> when I was well over fifty years of age, I suddenly realized this is a great game, I have my own ball and nobody's trying to grab it, and I have all the time to hit it, and it's a sitting ball. In every other game, 
ball is coming at you at various angles, velocities, spin, speed, all kinds of things. Here it is a sitting ball and everybody becomes quiet in respect for the goof-up that you may do. <laughs> so to hit a sitting ball, what is the big challenge, I thought. So I never took a lesson, I never been on a driving range. It's a sitting ball, I never take a practice swing in the entire eighteen holes. But it's a sitting ball. If your faculties are okay, if you're reasonably geometrically well-balanced when you stand, you can hit the ball. You may not become a pro, but reasonable level of golf, every reasonably fit man or woman can play. But unfortunately, they have a mental problem. In my understanding of the game, seventy percent of the game is in the mind. So I play only seventy percent, the other thirty percent I never bothered because I don't want to be a professional or be in a competition or something. So I only pay seventy percent of the golf, so I finish, uh, you know, five, six, seven over. It's okay with me, I am not planning to go under, so it's okay. While we deal with difficult relationships where one cannot avoid the other person, be it the boss or your wife, more often than not, I feel out of control and the whole environment seems to be conniving against me. Can I deal with this situation on my own? Is it okay to blame somebody else? What do you suggest is the way to get back to life in a positive way? See, the best thing about this is uh, you're only facing one of them, either boss or the wife, never two of them together. So, you can oscillate, you know <laughs> As a military man, you can escape the wife for some time and you can escape the boss for some time, unlike other jobs where every day they have to face. I'm sorry, I'm just joking like this <laughs> Anyway, see, uh, you can neither live without your wife nor your boss. Both are important in your life. You sort the career and you got into the job, you got a bas boss. You sort ma relationship, you got into marriage and you got a wife. So these are things that you aspired for. When things that you aspire for happen, then you suffer. This must be looked at. This is not about the wife, this is not about the boss. This is something to do with yourself because human beings have gotten into this place, wherever you place them, they have found a way to suffer. Why are you guys so serious? Come on! So I think we are wearing masks, that's why probably… Oh, I'm not able to see you smile. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I thought I will hear some laughter at least, so let me tell you a joke. This happened. One day Shankaran Pillai had a mega fight with his wife. Then in a fit of fury, he left the home and walked away in the evening. He loitered here and there just outside the town, he was moving around not knowing where to go, what to do. Going back home immediately was not palatable. Then he saw a sadhu, a sannyasi was settled down, settling down beneath the tree for the evening or the night. He looked at him and uh, he lo he seemed to be very well organized and absolutely no issues. Under the tree, he seems to be perfectly fine. Then he went to him and said, Sadhu Maharaj, bivi bhot parishan de raha hai, kuch sulub upay hai to bolo. The sadhu glared at him like this, Bevakuf, sulub upa hai to mein kyu sadhu ban ke yaan baita raha hoon <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> see, uh, we say this, like uh, life is like juggling a ball. If you're alone, just one ball, easy to do. You become two, two balls, little more difficult, more leads more attention. Then you become four, you have four balls to juggle. Then you have an Indian army on you, you have ten thousand balls to juggle, all do you? So how many balls can you juggle joyfully? That's how many you should pick up. If you aspire or enhance your activity without enhancing yourself, Activity will cause misery. 
So people, uh, you know, uh, one top executive in the country of an international company, a global CEO, came to me some time ago and in a deep state of distress and said, Sadhguru, I can't take this, they're putting so much stress on me. I looked at him and said, okay then, may you be fired. He said, no, no, Sadhguru, what are you saying? I said, hey, you're suffering your job so much. I'm sure there are many people who are aspiring for your job. If you get fired, you can walk the beach happily. No, 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 Sadhguru, don't do that to me. So if you're in the job, you'll suffer. You'll get fired if you suffer. If you're married, if you suffer. Married, if you suffer, you will suffer. If you're <laughs> don't... if you're not married, you suffer. What is the problem? The problem is this... this one. Not with the wife, not with the boss, not with the world. Whatever they may be, I'm not trying to defend them. They may be anything, but whether I suffer or don't suffer is essentially with me. As I said earlier, what the world throws at you is not your choice. What you make out of it is one hundred percent your choice. This is what karma means. When I say my life is my karma, wife is somehow, boss is somehow, the world around you is somehow, all kinds of uh, nuisance happening <laughs> But uh, I keep this one the way I want. You may... <laughs> I know you face different kind of enemy, but we face all kinds of people every day. People that I've never met, that I do not know, they have... <laughs> they're spewing venom on me on daily basis, I don't know. From where that venom comes, maybe it's just pro extra protein in their body, I don't know. But uh, they go on endlessly, doing all kinds of things, putting all kinds of obstacles to everything that we do. Everything that we do is inclusive for larger well-being, but they don't like it. There are people campaigning right now against me <laughs> today that tree planting is dangerous. Okay. <laughs> Your existence itself is dangerous. So, what people do to you, what the world does to you, this is how it is. What do you want to do to yourself? That is in your hands. This is your karma. This is what it means by saying, my life is my karma means the way I am is hundred percent mine. Nobody. Nobody can decide how I will be right now. It's me who decides how I am right now. If you decide how you are right now, Will you keep yourself blissful or miserable? If you can answer this one question, all of you. Uh, Sadhguru, uh, how do you relate the concept of Shiva and Yoga? Well, uh, right now most people's understanding of Shiva is uh, from the calendar images. These days I see uh, uh <laughs> particularly... Mm, I think it's both North India and South India, but I think it's more in the North. They are making Shiva look like a chubby, sweet-looking man, okay? No mustache, no beard, nothing sweet-looking, baby-like man. No, if you look at the stories, he is one of the most athletic gods that you can think of. And above all, wherever you see him, he's sitting in yogic postures, he's the f yogi, he's a yogi, and he's the first yogi. So he... The, the reason why we remember people for thousands of years is because of their contribution to us. See, we must understand, we all of us are self-centered human beings. Right now, we will remember somebody with great affection, love or devotion simply because of the contributions they've made to our lives. Along with Shiva, many others might have lived on this planet, but who cares whether they existed or not? We don't think about them, it's only a few human beings that we revere because of the contributions he has made to us. What is his contribution, Adi Yogi's contribution to us? Because he was a yogi and people had never seen one like that before, they called him Adi Yogi or the first yogi. So what is his contribution? His contribution is he explored the mechanics of life, life like it has never been done before, nor has it been done lay after. One hundred and twelve ways in which a human being can attain to the highest ultimate level of liberation and well-being within oneself. Hundred and twelve different ways of exploration. So these hundred and twelve ways were taught to the seven yogis who are today 
being referred to as the Saptarishis and also Devi Parvati. These were the eight people who became beneficiaries of this knowledge. From there, it has come down with various distortions and various interpretations, but fundamentally the science of yoga. What the science of yoga means is, see, he is like over fifteen thousand years ago, but probably only now for the first time, the world is getting ready for him. So, Adi Yogi is not of the past, he is of the future. Why I am saying this is, today uh, you are here and many of you have children. You clearly know that with your children, unless you say something logically sensible, they are not willing to take it from you. Even if you happen to be a very loving, doting parent, still they don't take it from you. Is that so? Are you seeing this? Because for the first time, in the history of humanity, the human intellect is more cultivated in maximum number of people than ever before. This is the first time that such a large percentage of humanity can… is beginning to think logically, otherwise it all went by belief. So only when people uh, start thinking logically and looking at life logically, uh, a scientific approach to human well-being is a possibility. Otherwise, the way we have handled our well-being is by looking up. So, you look up and think something will come from there and make you well. When it doesn't work, people will say, don't worry, you will go to heaven and there everything will be well. Now you ask the youth, do they want to go to heaven? They don't want to go to heaven, it's a very sensible population. For the first time, we understand that this is the place to live, not another place somewhere else. The idea that there is a better place to live elsewhere than this itself is a crime. This is the place to live. And how do you know, what proof do you have that this is not heaven? This is heaven, but you're messing it up. So a time has come when everything has to be logically correct. That means instead of handling our well-being through belief system, through philosophy, through ideology, through all kinds of cranky things, now we have come to a time where we want to address our well-being in a scientific manner with tools and technologies for well-being. This is what he gave over fifteen thousand years ago. But all these years, all we did was largely, not everybody, there has been a whole yogi culture in this country. It is only in the last five hundred years it's kind of diminished. But except for a segment of the population, all others just worshipped him. He did not ask for worship. He did not behave in such a way that he demands worship. He is simply there giving these tools for transformation. For those who used it, it worked. So a time has come where populations on the planet are more ready for a scientific and scientific approach to human well-being and using technologies for well-being. Time has come, so in many ways, Adi Yogi or Shiva is not of the past, he is of the future because it is not a philosophy, it is not an ideology, it is not a belief system, these are technologies for well-being and this is definitely the way for the future generations everywhere in the world. Though we would have uh, wished this e fascinating evening to continue Sadhguru, we, we are cognitive of the time constraints. I now request Air Vice Marshal Pavan Mohi to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Namaskaram, sir. It's a honor to, uh, uh, to be with you, uh, I mean, you are a, you're a high, hugely decorated officer. Namaskaram to you. Namaskaram to you, sir. Respected Sadhguru, first of all, on behalf of the entire senior fraternity, I wish to express my profound gratitude to Sadhguru for taking time out to speak to us. It's indeed a rare honor and a proud privilege. I have hosted you this evening, though in the virtual mode. <laughs> Great strength of it... this teaching is the idea that we can train our minds to turn these unfavorable circumstances around and make them work to our advantage. Once again, I thank you, Sadhguru, for having enlightened our minds. We should cherish this interaction and look forward to hosting you in CDM campus again. Jai Hind. Namaskaram.